in the name of God, the most merciful, the most kind, and humbly allowed us to be more gracious with God, the Lord of all the worlds. Well, thank you for that um, uh, welcome. I, I, I like the fact that you call me cool. Um, <laughs> my, my son calls me Leg. It's the nicest thing you can actually call me. Um, but uh, I've just uh, turned 40, and Robin the Bill keeps calling me Auntie Sarah. And I'm like, enough with the auntie. Um, yeah, enough with the auntie. Um, so, I think you know this, this notion of British. Can't hear me you can't hear me properly. God, I'm not, I'm not speaking of anything. Am I actually on? <laughs> My guess is that it's not, and I'm just. Right. My mic is should in theory be on? Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> Fabric 
of our history and the fabric of our culture, part of our legends, part of our storytelling and our narrative as a people. And that's what a national identity is about. It's a narrative. But it's a shifting narrative and a changing narrative. It's not static. And you find that about cultures. Cultures are not static. They, they come all the time. They're moving, changing, flexible, living, dynamic things. The narrative of being British. And we, as Muslims in Britain today, are part of the new narrative. We're part of the 21st century. We are shaping our narrative, and it's really up to us to define what it means to be British today, because we are part, part and parcel of what Britain is today. So I've got a few pictures here, and I was thinking to myself of a few of the, you know, the old school, if you like, the British Muslims of the past. Just I've got about five of them. This is uh, Marmaduke Pixel, the translator. This is Abdullah Quilliam. This is the Quilliam that uh, you might want to reference. Um, so, um, this is Islam, we didn't phonetically change it, but as the religion of the pure and true. And 
and you had three Chinese. <coughs> their names, with their pagoda mosques, with that essence of what Islam meant in an authentically Chinese way. An authentically Chinese understanding of the message of Islam. And it's the, the lessons of the pagoda that we need to take hold of, really. Because Islam is not a culture. It is not a monolithic culture by any stretch of the imagination. It is a dynamic, living entity. It is a living faith. And we say it's for all people and for all time. And you can understand that in two ways. It's for all people and for all time because we replicate. We take it, we copy it. We say 7th century Arabia, we took it in the photocopier machine and we make carbon copies for everywhere we go. For all times and for all places, here you go, here's the carbon copy, here's the carbon copy, here's the carbon copy, replicating through time and space. That doesn't work. It can't work. Because cultures change, times change, needs change. So if we are to be true that Islam is for all time, for all people, and for all spaces, then it has to be that it's not because it replicates, but because it generates. It generates answers and it generates solutions based upon our needs of today. So if we're to look and say, what are we going to do? Are we going to be creating the beautiful astrolabes that we've seen? No, because that's not our needs today. We need, you know, satellite monitoring systems and GS and GMS and all of the technology of the day. We want to try and go with our space now, our time now, but still deeply rooted to the values, the principles, the moral framework that Islam is generating within us. So that it's for all time and for all people, not because it replicates, but because it generates. So if we're to take the lessons of those early Muslims with their pagoda-style mosques in China 80 years after Hijra, and we say, we're in Britain today. What are the needs of this time in this space? And this time, the 21st century, will be different to, you know, William and uh, Lord Henley and Marmaduke people, because the time has changed. But the place, what are the needs? How can we generate answers, solutions, today. <coughs> and why are we having, let's face it, why are we having these discussions? Why are we asking these questions about British and Muslim? Why are we quite frankly navel gazing about issues of identity and issues which are uh, referencing who we are, do we belong, are you British first or Muslim first, <coughs> where's your loyalty? <coughs> and these questions, my goodness, how many times are these questions going to be asked? How many times are we going to ask ourselves these questions? And the reason why we pick on this topic <coughs> is fear. Fear. Even though we should be sensible enough and wise enough to know that really the only thing to fear is fear itself. The only thing to fear is Allah. But actually the irrational fear is, is a, something which warps our minds and, and changes our ability to think rationally. But we're scared. We're scared because all men around the age, most of you in this room, ordered tubes in London with explosives. We're scared because we think other men or women will do the same. We're scared because we don't understand how that can be done. We're scared because Muslims seem to be all over the world and they seem to be powerful but yet frenzied. Scared, 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 fear, violence. And how are we responding? A lot of the time we respond by saying, well, we're anti-violence. We're anti-extremism, we're anti-terrorism, and then some politician, like I remember Baroness Thatcher, um, or it might be a report, recently written perhaps, out of the Home Office, and 
event, perhaps, that might turn around and say, well, we haven't heard enough from our organisations, like BOSIS, perhaps, that you're not doing enough on campus to tackle extremism. You know, with these Muslim clerics or Muslim leaders who haven't spoken enough to say you're anti-violence, anti-extremism, anti-terrorism. Well, I'm so sorry. But I'm not guilty. I'm so sorry, but I am not violent, extreme, or a terrorist. I'm so sorry, but I refuse to have to constantly define my identity by the actions of others. I'm so sorry that I will not play this mantra of defensive, apologetic, back to the wall discourse where I have to say and reference this 300 pound ugly gorilla of violence that must always be brought into the room and we must have it in the middle and we must say, no, no, we want to talk about positive things, but of course we must reference this that I'm against this 300 pound giant elephant here. Oh, I'm anti this 300 pound giant elephant here. Oh, I, you know, I must be against this 300 pound elephant of terrorism, violence, extremism. But of course we won't reference this point. No, 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 we know you nice Muslims, you good ones, the ones that you don't do, the <laughs> acceptable ones. But of course we have to bring in the 300 pound elephant. But we're not allowed to bring in this other 300 pound elephant which is called foreign policy. No, 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 we can't reference this possible 300 pound elephant to say that this might be a slight cause of the problem. No, it's your warped theology. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the fact that people might be actually angry of our policy since like forever. <laughs> I'm 
human beings. Maybe in a hundred years. Great, we're finally being 
people recognise as a civilization. <laughs> <laughs> so this is useful. And for years I propounded, I propounded the uh, coexistence of civilizations thesis. And then after a while I thought, you know, this isn't enough. We're not, this isn't sufficient. We can't just be coexisting in our civilization side by side. And now I propound the collaboration of civilizations. And it has to be collaborative. We have to work together. That wonderful series of, on the shoulders of giants, our history. It was a collaborative venture. We took knowledge from all sorts of places all around the world. We were prepared to merge that, add our new ideas, take it forward. Other people took it forward from there. There was energy going in there, the ideas. Because, and this, as I kind of run out of time, comes down to what I, I would call one of the seeds. We have four C's of the company I work for, and now, but the four C's, the first one of these, we had loads of it. We had bucketfuls of the first C. We came out of the prophetic era, and we were so full of this particular um, C that we went out and we energised large segments of the whole world. And that C is confidence. We were filled with confidence. We knew who we were. We were strong. And even though the identity was Chinese or Nigerian, or I mean, some of the United States, but it went across the world and it, was, it went into different parts all over the globe. And it had on its own local custom, its poor local custom. Sharpie understood this. When he travels and he changes 80% of his stick in a tiny journey from Baghdad to, to Cairo, 80% of the has changed just in that little journey in the same time frame. But yet we expect Fifth to remain stagnant when we've traveled 15 centuries and, you know, 5,000 miles. We expect the same Fifth. Do we understand this? Slight digression. Um, right, so back to confidence. We need to be sure of who we are. And be strong and say, yeah, absolutely. I know where I'm coming from. I don't need to be this defensive referencer of this gorilla that I didn't create this monstrosity I had nothing to do with. I need to be looking and feeling strong about what I am. Because I truly believe that confident people, as history has shown us, are better able to contribute. To contribute. To give of themselves. To turn around and say, I am a doctor, I am a dentist, I am a mathematician, I am an artist, I am a musician, I am a, uh, a teacher, I am a, uh, you know, a wordsmith. Wordsmith, a lover of words. You know, I am capable of giving and contributing of myself. Deeply rooted, deeply rooted in my faith which has anchored me, which is generating the values and the principles from which I draw. And I am able to contribute. Who am I going to contribute to? Am I going to keep it to myself? <laughs> oh, no, it's only for the Muslims. Just for the Muslims. Chosen. <laughs> I cannot see how. When the Quran came as a message to the whole of humanity, and the Prophet came as a mercy to mankind. Not to the Muslims, chosen people always. Anyway. The whole of mankind. And so it has to be that we are confident, drawing and being inspired by, our, by who we are, the richness of our values, the richness of our principles to offer, to contribute to the common good. Making the connections between people. Making the connections between faiths. Making the connections between our histories and our futures found within our present. Making the connections between the divine, who quite frankly modern modernity has wanted to cut off from any discourse and bringing the divine in, in the vertical relationship to spread out to the horizontal of our activities. And so, this notion of a living faith that turns the abstract, oh, Islam is a religion of justice, what does that mean? What does that mean if you're not just to your neighbour?
Geneva. Islam is a religion of justice. What does that mean? If you do not look after your elderly neighbor four doors down, down. Islam is a religion of justice. If there are poor people living on your street and you do not help them. Islam is a religion of justice when you do not give of yourself to help the homeless and create a just framework of, of living standards. Or Islam is a religion of environmental Right? 
beards or and we have our, this is the prayer map that we have GCSE Islam right this is it GCSE Islam they pray five times a day they go to the mosque and they have these domes or these minarets and they face Mecca and they eat this food and it must be halal of course and um, and then they don't really know what halal is, we won't go there right now. And they wear the scarves, and it's called the hijab, or the niqab, or the abai, or the chador. And you know, and they, they're men, and they wear these namaz for two days. And they have these jhanamaz, and they do anyway. We go up, and they have these GCSEs, and these little kids, right? I've, I've seen these little kids, my son has to go through them. And he sits there, and he's like, oh yeah, so what do they do? And they do it for all of the religions, let's face it. And the Jews, they do this, and they wear these uh, young looks, and they go to these, uh, you know, synagogues. And it's GCSE religion, right? GCSE Islam. And that's what Muslims do. Sorry, Mu Islam. Mu Arabic, the one who does. Right? Islam, self-surrender unto God. The one who self-surrenders unto God. Right? It's an action, it's a verb, it's a doing thing. It's not a noun and a title, like Lord and Lady this. It's an action. And that action is righteous deeds. It's faith in action. It's a living faith. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You may emigrate tomorrow. You may be here for the rest of your life. The principle remains the same. Your actions are generated based upon the values and the principles of the notion of self surrender of God. Okay, I think I said if any good is from a lot of mistakes, they are mine, truly. And thank you very much. Thank you.